Civilization's going to pieces. Rapcon told violently. I've gotten to be a terrible pessimist about things. Have you read The Rise of the Colored Empire? Spider Man Guard Art? Why, no. I was surprised by his tone. Well, it's a fine book, and everybody ought to read it. The idea is that the idea is if we don't look up, the white race will be the utterly submerged. It's so scientific stuff. It's been proved. Tom's getting very profound, said Daisy, with an expression of unthoughtful sadness. A raised deep boobs with long words in them. What was the words we? Well, these books are all scientific, insisted Tom, glancing at her impatiently. This fellow has worked out the whole thing. It's up to us who are the dominant race to watch out. For these other races, you will have control of things. We've got to beat them down, whispered Daisy, looking partially toward the farpin' sun. We ought to live in California. Give me his finger. But Tom interrupted her by shifting heavily in his chair. His idea is that we are Nordics. I am, and you are, and you are, and... After an infinitesimal hesitation, he included Daisy with a slight note, and she winked at me again. And we produce all the things that go to make civilization. All science and art know that, do you see? There was something pathetic in his concentration, as if his complacency, more acute than of old, was not enough to him anymore. When, almost immediately, the telephone rang inside and the butler left the porch. Daisy seized upon the moment for interruption and leaned toward me. I'll tell you a family secret, she whispered enthusiastically. It's about the butler's nose. Do you want to hear about the butler's nose? That's why I came over tonight. Well, he wasn't always a butler. He used to be the civil polisher for some people in New York that had a civil service for 200 people. He had to polish it from morning till night until finally it began to affect his nose. Things went from bad to worse, suggested Miss Baker. Yes, things went from bad to worse until finally he had to give up his position. For a moment, the last sunshine fell with romantic affection upon her glowing face. Her voice compelled me for restlessly as I listened. Then the glow faded, each light deserting her with lingering regret like children leaving a pleasant street at dusk. The butler came back and murmured something close to Tom's ear where Pon Tom frowned, pushed back his chair and without a word went inside. As if his absence quickened something within her. Daisy leaned forward again, her voice glowing and singing. I love to see you at my table, Nick. You remind me of a, of a rose, an absolute rose, doesn't he? She turned to Miss Baker for confirmation. An absolute rose? This was untrue. I'm not even faintly like a rose. She was only extemporizing, not a stirring warmth flowed from her as if her heart was tr trying to come out to you, concealed in one of those breathless, thrilling words. Then suddenly, she threw her neck on the table and excused herself and went into the house. Miss Baker and I exchanged a short glance consciously, devoid of meaning. I was about to speak when she said up alertly and said, Shh, in a warning voice. A subdued, impatient murmur was audible in the room beyond. And Miss Baker leaned forward, machine. 
trying to hear. The murmur trembled on the barge of car hearers, sink down, mounting excitedly, and then ceased altogether. This Mr. Gatsby is, uh, is my neighbor, I said. Don't talk. I want to hear what happens. Is something happening? I inquired innocently. You mean to say you don't know? Said Miss Baker, honestly surprised. I thought everybody knew. I don't. Why? She said hesitantly. Tom's got some woman in New York. Got some woman? I repeated blankly. Miss Baker nodded. She might have the decency not to telephone him at dinner time, don't you think? Almost before I had grasped her meaning, there was the flutter of a dress and the crunch of leather boots, and Tom and Daisy were back at the table. It couldn't be helped, cried Daisy with tense gaiety. She sat down, and glanced searchingly at Miss Baker and then at me and continued. I looked outdoors for a minute, and it's very many outdoors. There's a bird in the lawn that I think must be a nightingale come over on the canal or my side line. She's singing away, her voice sang. It's romantic, isn't it, Tom? Very romantic, he said, and then miserably to me. If it's light enough after dinner, I want to take it down to the stables. The telephone rang aside, certainly. And as Daisy shook her head decisively at Tom, the subject of the stables, in back all subjects, vanished into the air. Among the broken fragments of the last five minutes, I remember the candles being lit again, pointlessly. And I was conscious of wanting to look squarely at everyone and yet to avoid the lies. I couldn't guess what Daisy and Tom were thinking. But I doubt if even Miss Baker would seem to have they seemed to have mastered a certain hearty skepticism, was able utterly to put this fifth gas true metallic urgency out of mind. To a certain temperament, the situation may, might have seemed intriguing. My only instinct was to telephone immediately for the police. The horses, needless to say, were not mentioned again. Tommy Miss Baker. With several feet of twilight between them, strode back into the library, as if to a vigil beside a perfectly tangible body. While trying to look pleasantly interested and a little deaf, I followed Daisy around a chain of connected verandas, verandas to the porch in front. In its deep gloom, we sat down side by side on a wicker settee. Daisy took her face in her hands, as if feeling its lovely shape. And her eyes moved gradually out into the velvet dusk. I saw that turbulent emotions possessed her. So I asked what I thought would be some steady questions about her little girl. We don't know each other very well, Nick, she said suddenly. Even if we are cousins, he didn't come from my wedding. I was back from the war. That's true, she had to it. Well, I've had a very bad time, Nick, and I'm pretty cynical about everything. Evidently, she had reason to be. I waited, but she did, didn't say any more. And after a moment, I returned rather vividly to the subject of her daughter. I suppose she talks and eats and everything. Oh yes, she looked at me absolutely. Listen, Nick, let me tell you what I said when she was born. Would you like to hear? Very much. 
I'm sure you have gotten to feel about things. Well, she was less than an hour old and time was God knows where. I woke up out of the ether with an utterly abandoned feeling and asked the nurse right away if it was a boy or a girl. She told me it was a girl. And so I went and so I turned my head away and wept. Alright, I said. I'm glad it's a girl. And I hope she'll be a fool. That's the best thing a girl can be in this world. A beautiful little fool. You see, I think everything's terrible anyhow. She went on in a convinced way. Everybody thinks so. The most advanced people, and I know. I've been everywhere and seen everything, done everything. Her eyes flashed around her in a defiant way, rather like Tom's. And she laughed with thrilling scorn. Sophisticated? God, I'm sophisticated. 